All right, so my um, practice is wet, wet felting. Um, if you're not familiar with felting, felting is essentially um, a textile that's created by entangling fibers. So instead of like um, knitted fabrics that are, you take raw wool and spin them into yarn and then you knit them, or wovens, which you take that yarn and weave them. Um, felt is just purely raw fiber that's meshed together um, with the application of soap, water, and um, pressure and friction. So you just are essentially using friction to mat all these fibers together. Um, so to start the felting process, I lay out a piece of bubble wrap, and this is great because it has a texture which when you're doing your rubbing adds to the friction um, of the piece. And um, we start with our wool fiber. So wool comes in, you can buy it in just batches, and this is called roving. Um, wool is a stable length fiber, which means it has a set length to it. So um, most wool fiber is around like three to five inches long. It depends entirely on the sheep breed and what area of the sheep you get the wool from. And stable length is um, <clears throat> as opposed to like a silk thread, which is a filament fiber, which is just one continuous strand. So what we do with this is we pull little tufts off of our roving and then lay them down to form your base of the piece. Um, it's very important to how you hold your wool roving while you're doing this. If you hold it too close, you're going to grab the ends of those fibers. And if you hold it down here, you'll grab a tuft that's too thick. And so this will just end up like a big wad when you go to felt it. So you have to be, you take your non-dominant hand and hold it about probably six to eight inches down. And then your dominant hand, you just use this kind of like a mitten and you just pick up a fine little strand or tuft of fibers. So when we go to lay these down, we want them to overlap because if they're not overlapping, there'll be a little gap in your piece, obviously, and you want these all to be relatively uniform in thickness. So the entire piece has the same thickness. Um, show you. When you go to lay, the initial lay is super easy. So you're just sort of laying all your fibers on top of each other to create a nice foundation for your work. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So does it, it doesn't matter about directionality? Or does direction matter? Direction um, does matter. So with decorative, um, sort of decorative felt projects, um, you want a really firm foundation. So I'll lay all my fibers in the same direction. And then if you're doing like a purse or a slip or something you want really thick, your next layer will be perpendicular to it. Okay. Yeah, and so you just keep going back and forth like that. So when I lay my foundation, I do all the fibers the exact same way. So with my, my colored felt work, I usually use a sort of green tone base because my flesh has a, a pink and red undertone. And so that contrast will make the pink of the flesh actually pop a little bit more. So I can see like I can see the white table underneath here, so I know I need to play more fiber on top there. So then with direction two, um, I, I like to, I don't like to use painting with felt because I think for a lot of people that implies that I put color on afterwards, which I don't. I buy my roving pre-dyed and then I mix my palette with dry wool. But my application of the colors or the tones to the piece is very painterly. So that's when direction for me does matter because the direction isn't about the um, density or stability of the fabric. When I start doing my design, it's about pure expression of the fibers on my piece. Um, and I always work usually from the photographs. So I'll um, photograph or have digital images. 
images on my computer and then I'll bring them up and just work out those. Um, but to get mixing, for mixing, I have mix a few here. I like to sort of do large batches so you kind of make your palette ahead of time. But I also mix as I go as well. I always want to stir it at the end too. So if I want like a tone in between these two, Moving my cups. And then when I'm mixing as well, you want to pay attention to the um, lay of the, fat, the fibers too, because if you if I start laying this way, they're going to start matting together and it's not going to be, you can, the fibers are going to start mixing so they're not easy to lay if they're not all the same direction. So this is what takes a lot of my time too, is just mixing the fibers. And then you put pressure on the end and then blend them together. And if anybody would want to try this, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> Some of your really large works, mm -hmm. you, do you make all of those colors drier? Um, so if I know I'm working on a section that's, um, say, like a shadowed section that's going to be particularly dark, I'll mix a sort of huge pile of the colors I know I'm going to use. But yeah. then when I go into more like detailed work, like on the face and stuff, I usually mix as I go then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll have some leftover. I usually have little tufts left over certain sections so I can bring that in but I will go in and be like oh no this blend is like quite light enough or right. the right color so I'll mix it as I go there. They very much build up from dark colors too so I sort of lay my dark colors out first and then build lighter colors. And this is the part that takes, I can spend anywhere from probably five days to two to three weeks on a piece just laying it out. Sure. Um, <clears throat> which is why I started doing this a little early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> does, yeah. It, does it stay in place pretty yeah. well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks so good. Yeah, as long as it's not windy. And you can kind of, um, once you've got kind of a section that you know you like, I kind of do this to kind of keep the pieces down. But it's great because you can also go back in and manipulate them if you move them around too much. Um, so a lot of it is um, laying tufts and building up some sort of gradient of color. But then for the detail work, so if I were to go in and put eyelashes on, take very fine pieces and I to manipulate them by just rolling them in my hand, the shape I want them. And then you go in and lay. The only problem with detail work though too is you can't, you don't want to roll these so they're like absolutely perfectly tight little coils because if they don't have some fluff left in them, they won't migrate and mesh with the other sure. They'll be like mad at themselves yeah. and so yeah. they won't map to the other. Yeah, so <clears throat> like a lot, like if you're doing like a decorative piece and say you're like, oh, I want polka dots on it, and you roll this super, super tight and lay this down, um, most likely it will just peel off sure. after you're done felting because you haven't left enough sort of air and space for the fibers underneath to migrate within a little detail work.
actual wet melting of it. So after you have it totally laid out, um, I go over like I said before and kind of push all my pieces down. a netting. You can use tool or it just has to be um, <clears throat> something that will not bind to the wool. So synthetic fibers are really good for this. Um, and this sort of provides a barrier between the felt and your hands while you're working on it so it doesn't just roll all around while you're matting it down. So then with felt, you need warm water or hot water, a bar of soap, the netting, and your hands. So you want to wet your fibers so they're saturated but not like puddled with water. So the whole fibers are covered in scales that sort of look like roof shingles. So when you add warm water and um, a mild alkaline substance like soap to it, it will help those scales open up. And so when you're rubbing them together, those scales start locking onto each other. So it's the crimp of the wool fiber, so that kind of curliness to the fiber and these scales that help the wool fibers mesh together, which is what makes it a great hair to use for pelting. So then we'll just gently rub our soap bar on top. You don't want a ton of bubbles, you just want enough to help. The soap will help um, fibers sort of slide around each other and start walking together. So when I'm doing my work, this is the most probably, I mean, besides the laying of the felt and the actual wet felting, this is the most delicate process because you don't want your detail work to move too much. So I always put kind of a hand down to hold the fibers down while I'm gently rubbing them. So you want to rub in circular motions, 360 degrees. You can go sideways and this way, but you want um, the pressure to come from all directions. Because if you just go this way, your felt will just shrink this way. Um, so you can see right now the fibers are already starting to migrate. It's amazing. Is that tight? Mm -hmm. You can start to feel as you do this. They feel very kind of airy right now, and as you keep doing it, it will feel almost like it's kind of glued down to the table, and you know that it's really starting to mat together. When that happens.
So I always like to start with my hands because I can feel how the fibers are sort of coming together. Um, but then this is also a palm board and it essentially is doing the same thing as the bubble wrap, having these little nubs apply friction to the felt so you can use this as well. And I use this when my wrists start giving out and my mm -hmm. hands get tired. <laughs> It seems like more aggressive too, maybe. Yeah. Sort of so like after it's sort of at least kind of minimally like coming together. Like, yeah. yeah. Then you can start using the uh -huh. board. It's great. Um, a lot of cultures have different tr traditions. Um, the one, I think, was in Mongolia as well. They'll take their felt and roll it up, and then drag it behind a horse for four hundred kilometers, and just the pressure of it being rolled up and dragged. The train will felt fibers together. Yeah, nomadic. Yep, absolutely. Oh. Might as well. So, can you use this with another? If you keep adding on to this piece, um, since you're already kind of adding things together, do you work piece by piece and then put it together as a whole, or? Um, no, so I work all at once, but you can definitely do that, especially if, um, so if you felt the interior and then sort of leave your edges very loose, those will felt right up with them. You can just layer on top of that and add to it. Um, and you can always check to see um, if your felt is done by, this is not even close, but when you go here and you pick this up, you can see those individual strands you want. No fight. You want this to come up as one whole piece. Gotcha. And that's how they can tell whether or not it's done. Um, Either warms fine. I like using hot because I feel um, if I have access to really hot water because it helps to open the fibers up a lot more and get them to kind of mat more quickly. larger the piece, the more often I tend to just hand rub the entire thing until it's melted completely. But if it's a little bit smaller and like the um, detail isn't so significant to me, um, I'll roll it up too. And that really helps to get the fibers to start shrinking together. Can you stop and start again, or is this sort of like once you're in it, you gotta sort of be in it? Yeah, um, you can. I think I've left it for like four or five hours and come back to it. Uh -huh. But when once I get it all laid out, which is usually, like I said, a couple weeks of work, I'm when I'm ready to felt, I'm like, okay, today's felting day. We're busting the whole thing out. Yeah, you just like want to get yeah. it done because with laying it out, it's I have no idea how long it's going to take me. 
there's an endless amount of things I can do to it. Sure. But when I finally sat, sat down and I'm like, okay, it's done. I know from start to finish, it'll be maybe five to six hours. So it's very satisfying to be able to finalize the piece yes, yeah. once you've worked on it for so long. So it's like, it's endurance in terms of like five or six hours is a chunk of time, but it's not yeah. like you're dealing with, I don't know, I was thinking like 12, 15 hours. Where it's like no. a marathon. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's doable. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. You just have a couple movies ready, you put them on <laughs> in the background, and just go to town. Definitely do you take a while to break slow because I usually used to do this on the floor, so I'm just like hunched over, crouched, and my back's just like, oh stop. Yeah. But I would probably keep going a little longer, but for the sake of time, I'll just show you how to roll it up as well. So then once you get it to a place where you think it's, um, they call it like a pre-felt stage, you can roll it up. Roll it up and then you do um, about 25 rolls this way. And you'll switch directions too, so just like the rubbing, you, you want to roll it <clears throat> in all four directions. You always want to check it at each stage to kind of see how it's getting along. So then I would roll it up this way as well, go from this way and then this way, but I think I'll just keep the hand rubbing it right now just because it's sort of up to you whichever method you feel like doing to get it down to a compact fabric.
I'm really impressed with like the scale at which you work because like this is doable. Like I yeah. can see like <laughs> that, that. This feels like you can make something 30 by 40. Mm -hmm. It like can work on a table. It works with like bubble wrap sizes and towel sizes. But yep. you like push into this realm that suddenly <laughs> things become. You've got some like barriers, and I'm just how do you. How did you come to that point? Or like what makes you work with scale? Because it's, I think that's something that's so important to the work that you make. Yeah, I think it's um, partly from, I think I'm able to express more detail the larger the pieces. It's easier to work on a larger scale for me, but also, when I consider the pieces, like we were talking earlier, I always think of them as how they can be useful and utilitarian off the wall as well. So when I started going bigger, it was always about a bigger piece of fabric could wrap the body tighter. Or could you take this off a wall and carry it with you and make a tent out of it or something like that, you know? So the bigger the cloth too, I think, um, it's more useful the larger it is. It, it removes its only artwork sort of quality. Yeah, suddenly. and there's there's so much work with felt too that's done on the miniature scale. Yeah, too, yeah. I was say it's similar. That I don't find I find cute, but I don't. Um, it doesn't appeal to me at all mm -hmm. in any way. Yeah, scale sort of limits the ability for it to be transcended into something other than just a uh, bit. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. This probably isn't as tight as I would normally get it. It's so amazing how when you flatten it, it just becomes this really clear mm -hmm. image. Whereas when you were laying it out, I'm like, oh, she's making one a bit more abstract. But it's yeah. like really impressive that it just sort of. Well, and a lot of times too, because I work on such a scale, I have to totally step away from it and get on like a ladder and photograph it yeah. from above because it's so hard to see sure. from my view and then when I walk like my partner is like I don't know about that piece but he's only seeing it from kind of the tufted up layers from the side sure. so it's very hard to tell what it is. Yeah that makes sense. Um, so once you get it done my favorite part is you can take it all up and then you sort of start throwing it and this also helps to just get those fibers to start shrinking up together too. It adds um, the wool hairs sort of go back to their, when it's flat like this, they're super flattened and tangled, but when you start doing this, it also kind of gives the crimp back to the fiber, so there's a little nice texture that I think. The piece of tap on them when you start burning it too. And it's just nice. My big pieces don't fit anymore, but I'll put those on a very gentle cycle.
touch to a very fine That is so impressive. Um, I usually will go back and if there's areas that need to be touched up, I'll put it back on the fabric and lay some under, usually kind of sandwich it if there's like thin areas. Or if it's part of the design, I don't. Sometimes you want kind of a spider web. Right, yeah, some of, some of your work has these sort of tendrils, not tendrils, but that kind of, I don't know, but yeah, these sort of threads that mm -hmm. come out. And I think it's, um, so like a lot of you, uh, utility felt like slippers and stuff it's very super dense and you can't even tell really what the fibers are yeah so I do really like this um, this sort of very fine sort of wavy feeling to the fabric and that you can actually see the fibers and see that it's made of hairs yeah yeah So is all wool felt made that the same process in some way or another? Um, like I'm thinking of like marine felt that's like literally yeah, inch, so three quarter inch thick. There's um, a lot of like mechanical processes now. Yeah. Yeah, and so they're all derived from the same process, but like the felt you buy at craft stores or like if you think of like those kind of cheap Christmas stockings, yeah. that's like synthetic felt right. that's just um, chemically like bonded together. Whereas if you're doing wool felt it is it's just friction and the fibers are so the structure of the fiber is so adapt at entangling it's like if you have like a very silky um you know straight hair and you put it in the braid and it immediately falls out if you have hair like mine i can put my hair in the braid and it it won't come out i don't even need a hair tie you know so i guess my hair is very similar to like a wool's Thing. It just naturally wants to mat together, right? So, and yeah, my hair does. Yeah, <laughs> I can't hold even a curl in my hair. It just won't happen. Yeah, so you can use other fibers and felt. You could add silks felt beautifully into them. Oh. Um, you can use cellulose fibers too, but you primarily you want to have at least fifty percent of the fibers you're using be wool content. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they just want to stick together and sure. fall out. Sure. Do you always use wool, or have you used other things? Um, I always use wool. Yep. I've tried it. So when I first started, um, I started doing felt because I came to it as a technique to add to garment making because I have a little shop called the compost pile. So I was just felt dyes beautifully too because it's a protein fiber, so it just soaks the dyes so you can get super rich vibrant colors, and that's a lot of what my garments are. So I um, initially started by. or something on top and they felt the wool into the skirt. So I started doing it with um, cotton gauze because it was affordable and it gives it a very sort of drapey, heavy steaminess feel, which is what the clothes in my shop look like. So that's how I first started felting everything with these very decorative, bright ponchos. Um, but eventually I kind of tired of just making things for consumers and consumption and then very quickly moved on. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you.